It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio. Flavored with a dash of humor. Welcome to intelligent, irreverent talk about plants and the planet they grow on. Your questions, comments, and participation are always welcome on Facebook and Instagram at The Mike Novak Show and at Mike Now on Twitter. Good planets are hard to find. Temperate zones and tropic climes. And true currents and thriving seas. Wind blowing through breathing trees. Strong ozone and safe sunshine. Well, good planets are hard to find. Good planets are in the main. Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Jet streams, perfect air. And here they are, Peggy Malecki and Mike Nova. Good planets are in the main. Right. And in honor of uh, cicadas everywhere across the United States, I uh, decided to put the uh, picture of the grasshopper. The grasshopper. Yeah. So. Thank uh, you, grasshopper. And uh, and good morning, everybody. The, the day after uh, for me, but not for you, Peggy, unfortunately, which is to say the day after I actually had rain, which is uh, pretty amazing stuff. Rain? Yeah, I know, and I feel I feel bad that that you didn't get it, and that's the nature of this drought. Chicago got I got about eight tenths of an inch in my backyard. Mm-hmm. We'll we'll be talking. Uh, by the way, Ricky D is back on the show Yay! today. All right, and uh, we'll be t- he's he's got maps. We've got uh, drought maps and for the, the rest of the country, but also for the Midwest and. Uh, We'll ask him, you know, what changes because we got a little bit of rain and probably not a lot, uh, except my own backyard. All I can say is I'm just <laughs> I'm gonna, concentrated I, right there in but, Logan Square. But what what you need to know also is that in the middle of this, my downspout uh, <laughs> came apart. Uh, so uh, it was pouring water everywhere uh, after a while. So. Uh-oh. I got to go back up and uh, and you got fix. Got your shoes wet in the process? Uh, uh, yeah, a little bit, and uh, uh-huh. but I didn't care because it felt nice. Uh, of course, I was trying to do show prep at the time, and and suddenly now an hour I find I'm in an hour on the back porch, holding up a downspout and trying to keep the water from going, and uh, it was it was. Uh, Did uh, you get a video of it? That's what I wanted. No. I did no. That, that's the that's the last thing that occurred to me. See, I'm at for a media guy. I'm pretty lame. All right, so, uh, folks, uh, we are so excited uh, today uh, to have a, a very special uh, show uh, featuring uh, a couple of people who have worked in the city of Chicago and have worked in environmental matters. Um, and uh, as I said on my blog. Uh, today, we are talking Chicago environmental smack uh, with the experts, uh, and they will be with us in just a second. They are Suzanne Malik McKenna and Sandra Henry. Uh, they both were important in guiding the city in environmental, environmental matters. You know, we need Bill Curtis here. I, what I want to, you know what I want to have Bill Curtis say? environmental smack um (laughs) (laughs) that sounds like something when he uh, used to do the wait wait don't tell me yeah like something he yeah Yeah. is is he not doing that anymore i don't know i don't listen to it anymore oh okay somebody somebody (laughs) will somebody will tell us one of our uh one of our listeners will definitely know yeah so in fact they're they're talking wow dan costa says he got 1.5 inches of rain. Wow, you are. You were in the right place, Dan. So that's good. And Peggy, and what did you get, Peggy? Uh, nada. Zippity doo da, zippity I went, I went to one rain gauge and checked it and said, okay, well, maybe this one's got a little leak or something in it. So I went to the other one. Yeah, nope. 
nothing, nothing. nada. And, that, <laughs> and, and so she's Lake County. So Lake County is still. Parts of Lake County got water, or got rain, but not but, close to the lake. But not your backyard. So there you go. And this is the, uh, these are the vagaries of um, this kind of a storm in the, in the middle. Uh, and, and if you look at the radar, and we'll, 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 we'll do that later. Um, Rick it, just, is back. It, yep. it just popped up over chicago and there was nothing else in the midwest and boom just this <laughs> big clump of storms right over the city of chicago yeah. and so um so we have two things before we get right. started with the show okay so let's do them very quickly yes peggy thing the first um we are as we announced last week we're going to be transitioning things more to youtube yep in coming weeks so um if you you haven't already yeah, go to, to watching us on youtube <laughs> uh, uh if if you haven't already go to youtube subscribe hit the little bell so you get notifications um and uh we're sliding over there because i you know i could go maybe maybe next week i'll i'll do my rant against facebook uh and and their algorithm and how it just squashes everything down especially if you're a business rage that, against the facebook machine that, yep. exactly um, so, uh, we are making that transition and we're just letting people know that, that at some point when you, when you go to Facebook, what you'll see is, Hey, here's the link to YouTube. Watch the show there. That's what's going to happen. Exactly. Um, all right. So that's one thing. And the other is Peggy. Chicago Excellence in Gardening Awards, 60 second garden video challenge. There's still a couple of weeks for the spring portion of this year's challenge, which is May and June gardens. Through June 30th, you're going to want to go to ChicagoGardeningAwards.org to sign up for that. It's free. Get out in your garden, get some beautiful photos, create a one-minute video, upload it, boom, done. Exactly. And uh, if you can't get it done in the next two weeks, never fear. The summer portion of it starts um, July 1st. But we want, we want to see your spring gardens. I'm sure you, if your garden looked good, you took a lot of photos, string them together into a video and uh and and send it to us and you Into could the video. valuable what <laughs> what's that stringing them together wrapping oh, them oh, around yeah. each other like like videos, like, like like dna like a dna <laughs> chain okay <laughs> yes i've got such a lag on on vmix this morning it's just amusing to watch that, oh so. I, i'm sorry but you look good here and uh, you seem to be in real time so yes go to chicagogardeningawards.org uh you still got a couple of weeks left for the spring section or session of uh the 60 second garden video challenge and we hope you take advantage of that and win valuable wally prizes all right with that said and actually one th one thing the third oh okay if you're watching this program this morning call all your friends your neighbors your kids anybody who's on facebook and youtube and let them know we're on with a fabulous show this morning tune in your, now your friends and your enemies all right bring them all because these are the people we have uh, oh and, and i should have known <laughs> <laughs> thank you suzanne you you oh you almost he just came getting in <laughs> you you almost made it on time uh and uh the, uh, the grand entrance uh from uh <laughs> Suzanne Malik McKenna and uh but, but Sandra was there as she needed to be. Thank you, Sandra, for being in place when the show started. <laughs> you know, all right. Uh, if you might not be able to read it, so I'm gonna pop this up there. And the title we gave to Suzanne Malik McKenna is Slayer of Multidimensional Challenges. Uh, and I decided this morning that uh, her real title is Disruptor, and you just proved it once again, Suzanne. So I like to be consistent. What can I say? You are. If, if nothing else, you are consistent. So uh, welcome, both of you, to the show. We're very excited about this. We're going to go uh, till uh, uh, 1030 here today uh, talking about a bunch of different I didn't even get all of them I realized I finished the blog and I posted it and I didn't get everything in there uh, but I, I'm hoping that some of this will, will come up during the show as uh, we discuss certain matters it will trigger conversation about other things um, so what I want to do here is do a, a couple of quick uh, introductions uh, of our guests, and uh, we'll start with uh, the the woman on your left, the disruptor, 
Um, and uh, she is Suzanne Malik McKenna, and she served the city of Chicago for 17 years, uh, first as head of the Natural Resources Division, later the Natural Resources and Water Quality Division for 13 years, working to engage Chicagoans in programs like Green Corps, which you're still involved in, right? You got uh, it. Uh, and uh, Chicago Conservation Corps, uh, and you helped develop programs like the North Park uh, Village Nature Center, the Calumet Initiative. I, I threatened that we might talk about, I know, that one is, we, we have to, we'll have to get into that because I know it's close to your heart. Um, and the Chicago Center for Green Technology. Um, and then uh, you were uh, four years commissioner of the Department of the Environment. Uh, you also oversaw permitting and enforcement, urban management, and brownfield reclamation and energy and sustainable business division. Uh, you've also worked with Chicago Wilderness, uh, Open Lands, and other environmental organizations. You're, you, you certainly uh, have your I've been child. around, baby. Yeah, around. <laughs> you have. Uh, and, and, of course, on your right uh, is Sandra Henry. Is, and I'm going to get the title right now that I didn't do in our little promotional video that I sent out the other day. Uh, Senior Director of Energy and Sustainability at Elevate, uh, which is a, a, a not-for-profit organization that designs and implements programs to reduce costs, protect people and the environment, and ensure the benefits of clean energy economy uh, and that it reaches those uh, who need them most. Now, we, I, will, I will give you a chance to talk a little bit uh, about Elevate in a little bit, Sandra. We'll definitely get to that. Uh, but Sandra served as the Chief Sustainability Officer for the City of Chicago at the very end of the Rahm Emanuel administration. And folks, that's a story in itself, which we will get to. Uh, and you worked to advance the city toward 100% clean energy by signing on to the Ready for 100 campaign, uh, committed to Chicago to electrify its bus fleet uh, by 2040, and a community-wide transition to 100% renewable energy by 2035. Um, and you were also, uh, before this, back in the day, back when I was at Progresso Radio, like the soup, uh, you were the Senior Energy Efficiency Program Manager for ComEd, um, and you've uh, designed and managed energy programs for utilities in Minnesota, in Illinois, and were the chair of the Chicago chapter of the U.S. Green Building Council, which is now Illinois Green Alliance, uh, from 2015 to 2016. So you also have plenty of chops, uh, Sandra. So uh, welcome. She's just not as old. She's just not as old. Uh, yeah, but she's... Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Maybe she's just better preserved than the rest of us. I don't know. It's, it's, <laughs> I sleep in pickle juice every night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So what I want to, how I want to start here is um, we've got some background on you, and I want you to talk, uh, uh, each of you, a little bit about your journey um, at, in the environmental realm and in uh, city government. Um, Suzanne, let's let's start with you. And you, you know, I'm thinking, just a, a few minutes of a, oh, kind of an. Of I know. Water. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm not crying. My eyes just bugging me all of a sudden. So, excuse me one moment. And yes, we, we have that effect on people sometimes. Yeah, I know. Everybody cries when they watch our show. All right. Yeah. <laughs> it's so touching. Uh, no, um, that, that's not the reason. Uh, okay. <laughs> but you know, it's. But I'm going to say this. It's funny you should say that. Uh, or have this happen to you because when you were on my program at Progresso, uh, this wow. was shortly after you found out that Rahm Emanuel was going to disband the Department of the Environment. Yep. He gave it the axe. Yeah. Um, uh, cause you came out of the daily administration and then Ram came in and said, no, we don't need that anymore. Uh, you teared up on the show. It was a pretty Did emotional I? moment. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I was so mad. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't about, you yeah. know, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, I was there 17 years time to move on. Yeah. But man, there were so many great things happening and such great people, you know, and I think it was just so short sighted. Um, how they went about it and um anyway do you, well, do, you, do, you do you have any any oh, I, eyes 
Are you uh, are you okay? Should we? Yeah, I got let's, okay. let's start with Sandra. I'll tell you what. I'll tell <laughs> you what. We'll. Uh, why don't you take care of that? Uh, I'm gonna. Uh, and uh, I you I'm not crying. <laughs> So let's let's go to Sandra then, okay, Sandra. I'm gonna uh, even put you up here. So uh, uh, see, uh, yeah, yeah. Suzanne, go take care of business. All right. Yep. Sandra, tell us your story because uh, obviously it, it involves uh, different states and um, a decision to move to Chicago and then ending up as the uh, chief sustainability officer. Tell us a little bit about that story. Sure, Mike. Thank you. And I just want to like touch on something that Suzanne mentioned about such great people in the Department of Environment. She's absolutely right. And a lot of them are still there. So I'll get to that piece as we kind of progress through the story. But um, I'll start with the saying that you mentioned on one of your shows previously that good gardeners make good environmentalists. And I feel like my basis for why I'm here right now is because I'm, I love gardening and I'm an engineer. So kind of putting those two things together, it really, being a gardener helped me get in touch with what was happening in the environment. And being an engineer and working with utilities, I learned that the most, still the most cost-effective way to um, mitigate climate change is not to generate kilowatts using coal or other carbon-based fuels in the first place. So that kind of set me on my trajectory in this energy efficiency realm. And for the last 30 years, I've been um, advocating and creating programs to help buildings save energy and um, not use carbon-based fuels. So kind of fast forwarding um, to Chicago, I got a chance to work on new construction buildings specifically and helping architects and engineers design buildings that were as energy efficient as possible before we even considered you know, connecting to renewable energy sources. And through the work with Illinois Green and other activities around the city of Chicago, um, in 2018, uh, I got a call from the current, that the CSO at the time, Chris Wheat, and he was moving into uh, the role as Mayor Emanuel's chief policy officer, and he needed to fill the chief sustainability officer seat. And he called me and asked me if I'd be willing to be considered. And I took that to mean that, okay, I'm on a list of folks that, you know, they're considering. And I, you know, your career coach will tell you if you always say yes when someone asks you if you're willing to be considered, <laughs> right? Um, I had no idea that I would be the one. Um, and so the process took, you know, probably three or four months and I didn't hear much beyond um, just like send me your resume or send me this. And then probably f maybe February or March of 2018, Chris calls me and he says, um, how would you like to talk to the mayor? And again, still didn't know if I was going to be CSO or not. And I said, okay, let's talk to the mayor. So we did. And um, after that discussion, which was really quite um, inspiring, he asked me when I wanted to start, <laughs> and that's how wow. I got the job. Wow! Yeah, it was pretty cool, you know. Um, and I was very excited about that because I, again, my platform is build energy efficiency in the buildings first, uh -huh. and that was my approach to um, the job. What I learned as CSO is there are already lots of things already in flight that need to be addressed and it was no different in Mayor Emanuel's um, administration. So uh, what, right what away. Do you, what, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so um, there, so when Mayor Emanuel, you know, had state had the event where he brought folks in to sign the climate, the climate justice or climate initiative I can't remember what year that was, 2017, I think. Um, there were a lot of kind of offshoots from that. Like um, there was this continuing desire from cities, other cities other than Chicago within the metro area for support and how to like, what's the path to a carbon free city? So that was one element. Um, another element is there is a lot of, there were a lot of things happening with recycling that needed to be addressed. Um, the tree canopy was another area that needed to be addressed. Um, 
there was already discussion within the city about how to get to 100% uh, clean energy, not only for the city at, in general, but specifically for city owned buildings. Um, mm -hmm. So the CSO role is very, very broad and didn't have a lot of staff. So uh, really, yeah, well, initially, because, I was because that department had been disbanded yeah. uh, a number of years right. before, which we'll get and to going, in a second. Which we'll get to in a second. So I got a, I had the pleasure of working with people that had been in the Department of Energy at the time, um, mm -hmm. which is a huge plus because they were able to run projects and manage all of the you know, sustainability environmental pieces without a CSO. And, you know, I think we're going to talk about this later, but part of the challenge in coming in in June of 2018 and then announce, having Mayor Emanuel announced he's leaving three months later, it, I never got a chance to really get my hands around the, the whole picture of the CSO job. There's also an environmental component. There are a lot of things happening on the southeast side related to pollutants like manganese and other thing, other pollutants in that area that needed attention. And dust is a huge issue as well with trucks and construction dust and asphalt. And all those things need to be regulated. And mm -hmm. the, the CSO job touches on, on all of that. So, um, uh, when when you say it, it touches on, and by the way, you're in a sense burying the lead because um, you got the job as CSO uh, in the uh, Emanuel administration, uh, which meant you had to move from the suburbs into the city yeah. to to be a resident here. And then three months later, he says, "Oh, by the way, I'm not running for mayor again." Um, that was speaking of disruption. That was a bit of a disruption yeah. to your life, wasn't it? It was a huge disruption. Um, we had to sell the house, pack our things um, in a very short time period. Um, yeah, that was a huge disruption. <laughs> so to get to Chicago, three, you know, within three months of the move, learn that the mayor is not running was a huge surprise, and it was a yeah, big surprise to everybody away. in the office. Well, the the CSO job is in the it's. It's required to have a CSO. It's in the city uh, statute. And the other thing um, you said, you, there was so much to absorb uh, in in the position. But as I mentioned, you didn't really have a department. Um, one of the uh, things that, uh, uh, and I and I found the quote, uh, the article that had it in there. We were talking the other day when we were setting uh, this up uh, that some uh, alder critters refer to uh, the CSO, the uh, Chief Sustainability Officer, uh, they refer to, to the department as cubicle of the environment, which is, um, <laughs> a, and, and because there's there's been, yes, one person. So we went from a staff, we went from an actual department under Suzanne yeah. uh, to the one person throughout Rahm's administration. And unfortunately, that has continued into the Lightfoot administration, even though and I've got the link here from her own page. When she was running, she promised that she would reinstate the Department of the Environment. Well, two years down the road, that has not happened. Um, Nine-point environmental policy. Yep. Um, yeah. And uh, it's a financial issue. That's, you know, it's, we want to talk about that. Yeah, the we money do. That, the mo this is my understanding, and Suzanne, correct me if I'm wrong, but the money that created the Department of Environment came from a lawsuit um, in 2000, whenever the, um, the heat wave happened. Oh, 1999. Oh, no, no, no. Uh-uh. No? That was, okay. That was, that was a great bank account, but it was not okay. what started it. was not what started it. So the, when Mayor Emanuel took office, my understanding was the bank account was pretty much gone. No. Well, yeah, no. well, let's let's. This okay, is the time we. This is the time yeah. we go to uh, Suzanne. Uh, well, and, it was a great bank account, and I will tell you about that. But but actually, when you do, hi everybody. <laughs> and and, <laughs> and, and and may I? Uh, how are your yeah, eyes? You, okay. And if you get a chance, might, just they might, cry, they might cry later if we okay. talk about stuff that could cause me to cry. Which there's plenty of things that can. But 
Um, I'm going to ask you to so, tilt down a little bit too, if you can do that. Is that possible with that camera? There we go. Yay. You want to see my cleavage? Is that what it is? Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So, uh, but then you settle back into your chair there. So, uh, anyway. Right. So, oh, fine. Here, here, here. <laughs> There. All right, there we go. I'm trying to be as professional I as possible. To my green books. Look at my green books back here. There's so many great books. There's wildflowers and um, all stuff about climate, and the Green New Deal, Last Child in the Woods. There you go. I just want to make uh, plugs. So. so tell us about that, the Department of the Environment and uh, and your role in it. Okay. Um, hmm. So what, how, how do you want me to start? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's... Uh, long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> All right, far, let far, me ask well, you a question about what happened just after you left. Do you know why uh, the department was disbanded? Why, why was it cut out? Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, there are different perspectives about how to run environmental action and policy at a municipal level. Um, and, and there are many cities that do it with a you know, a singular person who usually has some kind of staff and then coordinates amongst a range of different departments. Um, and so it's really, it's really an organizational structure issue, not as much a money thing. It really isn't because there are certain things happening regardless, like enforcement. And actually one of the biggest revenue sources for a department of environment is enforcement because you have to get, um, you need a big team doing great work on, air quality, water quality, even olfactory things. Soil, soil quality as well you were working on. Well, yeah, that's, 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 of course, that's the toxicity in the soil and what we need to do depending on the kind of development you want to do. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the enforcement group is big and wide and does a lot of work if that's their priority, right? And our priority was not let's bust people and put them out of business. It was more, let's help people comply <laughs> so we can keep these businesses, right? So we can keep people employed. If they can't comply, if they're not doing good business, they should go. But let's see what we can do first uh, to clean them up and make them a good citizen of the city, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the enforcement division, um, we submitted a lot of permits. People bought had to, had to pay for permits all the time. I, I'm not kidding you. I probably signed things. I probably signed 30, anywhere from 30 to 75 things a day for the enforcement division. Wow. Where there were permits, there were certificates, they were uh, sometimes lawsuits, they were administrative hearings. I mean, I was just constantly signing stuff for that group. It was really one of the busiest groups. Um, and for all of that, there are fees, there are fines, there are certificate costs, etc. And Oftentimes that would go into what's called general revenue, which is just the city's budget and you never see it. But I'm trying to remember what the numbers were, but I mean, it was several million dollars easy. Mm -hmm. And if, if you tie those types of things to operational aspects, you can actually make a lot happen that way. And again, it's not slamming people as much as when somebody sets up a, a, um, a new factory, we, I know there was a two part process. There was first the process of making sure all the equipment they use follows all the environmental guidelines, right? And there was some kind of fee for that. And then there was the operational fee that would have to, certificate of operation, I remember that one, before they started business, before they turned it on. And then there's an annual, um, an annual uh, visit, inspection, and recertification. Now, that probably sounds like we're gouging them. We weren't, it wasn't a crap load of money for the size of these, of these organizations. Um. But um, it, it, it brought in revenue. And if you, if you tie your budget to operations in that way, you can start seeing how it can, you know, a lot of things can drive itself. Um, and, you know, that, that's, that's what was lost in this process. So actually the beginning of the Department of Environment came from shoreline restoration with the Army Corps of Engineer. Henry Henderson was in the law department and he was, helping oversee and push the, the Congress to bring money to the Army Corps to rebuild our shoreline, which is now far, far, far underway, but it's taken many, many years. There was money from that, and then there was money from enforcement, and that's where the budget started to form. Okay. Uh, this okay. is a, a, a good introduction. Uh, we need to take a, a short break. 
Um, and uh, we will return uh, with some specific issues that I, I want to get into. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki this morning. We're talking Chicago environmental smack with the experts, and uh, we will be right back. A backyard gardener. Assist your soil in providing key nutrients to your plants with Spectrum Soil Inoculum from Tinyo Biologicals. The beneficial microorganisms in Spectrum break down and release vital nutrients and make them more accessible to your plants. Spectrum works with nature to decompose organic matter into humus, building richer, healthier soil. Spectrum is approved for use on certified organic crops and is OMRI listed. Get Spectrum at blazing-star.com. You can help slow climate change in 2021 by composting. And you don't even need a backyard. By composting communally in multi-unit buildings across Chicagoland, Collective Resource Compost has diverted 7,000 tons of food scraps since 2010. CRC brings you a fresh 5-gallon bucket or a 32-gallon neighbor tote with each pickup. You fill it with organic matter, they swap it out, and get it to a commercial composting operation. Fight climate change. Go to collectiveresource.us. Fozzie, what is this? Oh, Kermit, it's my new ball. I'm talking about this mess. Oh, that was the packaging. You know, Fozzie, when you buy things that are overpackaged, you create more garbage and hurt the environment. I do? Try to choose products that aren't overpackaged and recycle whenever you can. You mean like this banana peel? You can recycle a banana peel? Sure. Yeah! To find out how you can help, write to Make a Difference, National Wildlife Federation, Washington, D.C., 20036. Isn't comedy wonderful? <laughs> it sure well, is. I love that. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I love Kermit. I, I the Muppets are the best and I've been tracking down all these old I mean that that uh, Peggy looked up that address and it it's no longer valid. Uh, but finding these old PSAs out there, which still mm -hmm. resonate, and uh, it yeah. actually takes us to a subject that I want to get into, which is recycling. If oh, you're gonna, I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> well, you know, and if uh, full disclosure, I was president of the Chicago Recycling Coalition for uh, six years, so I've had a little bit of. Um, uh, involvement in this issue over the years and um, you know the question I, I, I oh let me ask you Sandra how much did CSO uh, work with uh, streets and sand and get involved when you when you were in that office uh, in the recycling program um, well CSO part of the first part of my job was just getting to know all the di different department areas so I did meet with Streets and Sanitation to talk about recycling and got a chance to learn about their education initiatives. Um, and then I think the, what is it, the Better Government Association. Association. Oh, that, oh, that yeah. happened while you, on your watch, right? Yeah, it did. We, it we've, did. We, we've had uh, Madison Hopkin Madison. Uh, on, on our show. She wrote a couple of articles. One was about uh, the double dipping uh, by uh, uh, waste management, um, and who just, uh, by the way, I believe just the other day, uh, Lakeshore started picking up the recycling uh, in Chicago. So waste management management was not brought back. Um, and so she did that first article about why are so many uh, blue cards being tagged as contaminated, uh, and where is that going? And then she did the second investigation a year later, um, and and it, when you were talking earlier, Suzanne, about um, uh, fines and fees, um, she was talking about how none, virtually none of the high rises in the city of Chicago are ever fined for not having recycling systems. And there are plenty out there. Um, uh, w why did that happen, Suzanne? Uh, why did what ha what part what pa well okay uh, i'm going to work my way <laughs> back why is it that the city could never find it in its heart to find the people who are violating the because, that yeah it has nothing about what, having it in their heart again that's an enforcement and operational issue so it, when you pass an ordinance so here's the problem if you and you were saying this last night i think in an email why can't policies and ordinances is it too difficult whatever it is a very meticulous process to build an ordinance and, and you want everybody to get behind it. Otherwise it's just going to get, people are going to talk smack about it and they're not going to 
work with you on it. And so every ordinance we tried to work on, we tried to bring in all the people who'd be for it, against it, what have you, and come up with something that people not only could live with, whether they liked it or not, but that was operational. Because if you pass an ordinance and you haven't figured out, the next step is regulations, you haven't figured out how to enforce that ordinance, how to operationalize that mm -hmm. ordinance, it's waste. So we have, you know, the plastic bag, we have all these different kinds of things, which are really- or how important. to budget for it. Right. Mm -hmm. If you if you haven't figured out the operations, you haven't figured out how to make an ordinance work. And so in that case, you know, with Streets and Sand, how many people would it take to actually inspect multi-unit buildings across the city of Chicago? I don't know the answer to that, but it certainly wasn't at the top of their priority when people are saying, can you pick up my branches in the back or what have you, right? And and so the the way Streets and Sand is designed, it's very much a current, it's a, it's a reactive. It's like, we wanna serve our people. We wanna serve our aldermen. So if somebody gets an aldermanic call and says, we'll get to this later, cut down my tree or <laughs> what have you, um, you know, it's, it's streets and sand makes the city hum, right? We, you know, garbage and towing and whatever and plowing, but um, so much of it is reactive. And so a proactive approach to that would have been to really figure out how do you merge and look at the inspection process that streets and sand has and maybe other departments together and figure out how you can make sure those inspections happen. And so one of the challenges is that, you know, you get, if I recall a long time ago, it was a teeny little ticket. And so property managers were like, you know, I'll take my chances. They'll never get here. Most times they didn't. So they didn't do it because recycling in this city and Sandra and everybody, I would love to hear my, my, my theory on this is it's expensive because, yeah. because it's cheaper to throw things away in this region than to recycle because our landfill costs are so low, mm -hmm. right? So, I don't remember what they are now, but back in the day, it was like forty dollars a cubic something. I don't remember what the cubic number was, yard. Maybe, and yeah. but in San Francisco is one hundred sixty, in New Jersey it was one hundred eighty. So they yeah. can afford to compost and recycle because the money they save from not dumping in a landfill, they can use a margin of that to do the recycling, to do the composting infrastructure, those kinds of things. So that's always been a big problem. I'm, get, I'm getting, <laughs> um, never mind. I'm getting notes from somebody. Uh -oh. here. Um, <laughs> that's okay. Sure you're, you're allowed just, to cheat. It's okay. Yeah, no, no. Just, just make sure like everybody's excited about this, right? We're, we're all passionate about these issues. So, so anyway, I mean, that's the problem is if we don't figure out how to operationalize an ordinance and you don't work with the people whom you will be enforcing against, right, uh, or enforcing with, or the people you're protecting, then you don't really know how it works, and then the system doesn't work. All right, well, um, let me ask you a question about that. Uh, you talked about inspectors and that sort of thing. What kind of responsibility did the Department of the Environment have um, in the recycling realm, uh, both, both for the high-rises and for uh, residential? Buildings. We did not have any enforcement responsibility. It's all streets um, and sand, right? It's all streets and sand. And so our, yeah. our job was to, um, what DOE did often, Department of Environment, is we were like kind of a, um, it started out, it would start out as like a think tank. You'd bring the departments together. You'd think about what are the challenges. Mm -hmm. We'd go out and do research. We'd, we'd bring people together. We'd figure out what, what are the best solutions? What are the funding yeah. sources? What are all those things? work with the operational departments and say, okay, looks like, what if we, what if we looked at it this way or that way? How could we, how could we pass solid legislation um, that could operationalize what we want to see in our city? And who are all the players and what are the costs and operations? So with soil and rubble ordinance, our water ordinance, our energy ordinance, all those became, I think, really cool partnerships with departments and players and construction people and all those kinds of things to make it functional. And I feel like they shrunk all, they took all of those roles and responsibilities from the DOE and put them right into the CSO spot. Um, and yeah. there's no way one, one office, one person could do all of that. And I just wanna to touch on the recycling piece because that um, article from BGA was great 
uh, and it highlighted a lot of, of, of issues with the recycling structure as it existed and currently exists today. And the aldermen, there are a couple aldermen that got um, that caught that caught their attention, and they called the CSO. They called me. They called Streets and Sanitation, and we sat down to just chat about how um, the work, how to, how it was currently operationalized. And what I learned is, it is a waste management for the city to actually like do waste management itself is is very expensive because the um, contracts with the you know streets and sand and the workers at the city require that each truck have two people. Waste management and other other waste companies can do the work with one person in the truck, and that was a huge cost differential. We actually crunched the numbers because there was a discussion about well, what if we what if the city just does all of that? And it's a it there was no in no momentum within the office to actually like talk about paying for that. That's um, right. Yeah. yeah. And I and think, it's, go ahead. Sorry. I mean, I think that when we want to talk about change, um, if we don't talk about unions as part of change, you're not talking about change. Um, yeah. And, mm. and this isn't a union slamming moment. You know, unions have a important place, but oftentimes the unions are stuck in the old days. And, what happens in this instance, as you Sanders example, one person to two people, oftentimes Streets and Sand has three people. And the big challenge is the motor truck, motor truck driver position. And that's a person who drives the truck and sits in the truck the entire time, whether they're pruning a tree or picking up recycling or any of that. Um, so, you know, I think that is a huge cost. It's the personnel cost in doing that. And then, it's, it's outfitting a truck, like in the suburbs or private companies who oftentimes have a lifter of its own. The person drives, they use the lifter to pick up the dumpster, dump it in and go. So that's all, it's like a dead in the water kind of thing because you're cutting positions if you do it in a more efficient manner that many, many, many cities and businesses do already. So it's right. up and there's, you're cutting labor and then you also have to look at your fleet and at the time, there weren't enough um, trucks, waste trucks to actually like serve the entire city because we've outsourced it to other waste haulers. So it's a it's, lot of cost issues. Yeah. yeah. So it sounds like uh, this has to be reworked from the ground up if we're going to uh, increase the uh, yeah. percentage, uh, the, the, the horrible recycling rate that we have in the city of Chicago. Um, how, well, there's what? two pieces to that. Yeah. You know, um, w one is that the, the, the waste is actually a commodity, right? And yeah. I don't know about the new ordinance. And by the way, I will always plug Chris, so Chris Sauvé at Department of Streets and Sanitation. He is a lone wolf of leadership and wants to do the right thing and, and is quite, quite helpful and collaborative. You know, but he gets, you know, the politics and everything kind of get involved and the economics and everything get involved. And, and that's really hard um, to push up against around etc um but the, the reality and, and, is and folks should know uh chris Ove has been there he's the, the the head of basically the recycling end of things and he's been there now through three administrations uh yeah. he was there when daly was there and through rom and uh and Lori lightfoot um and yeah i'm glad you're explaining this because uh I, I, there are some people and i'm listed among them wondering well if if you're if you're working so hard, why are you getting nowhere? Why why have yeah. we not gotten anywhere with this? Yeah, well, here's why the is thing. the news always the same? Right. And it, how how often have you had Chris on your show? Uh, I have not had him on right. in, in a long time. How often do you see him in the media? Very little, because yeah. right. you don't put somebody at that level into the media because the, the message has to be controlled. I mean, that's politics, that's government, of course. But there's a lot of knowledge in that department and many others about what can and should be done. But really yeah. it is, um, it's do you have the cojones? Um, I used to say conejos and people told me that was rabbits. Um, do you have the cojones? <laughs> I really was, I said conejos for like two years and people mm -hmm. are finally like, Suzanne, do you know you're saying rabbits? Um, 
Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, and they're I'm listening. listening. <laughs> um, but do you have the cojones to take on big issues like labor um, and the way that we're all used to doing things, including serving your aldermen operationally? Um, if, if you take that, that power, that resource out and make it more operational as opposed to political, you get a lot more efficiencies, but then people lose some of their oomph because they don't have their own team who can go out and do things based on people's requests. Right. And the other data point I want to share is Chris is an amazing fount of information. And at the time I was in the office, it was around the time China decided they weren't going to take our plastic anymore. And Chris and I talked about where's the market? Where do we send all this plastic? And I don't know if it's changed, but at the time, there was no place to take it. And on top of that, you have um, companies that create, you know, they use, they create plastic every day out of virgin materials, like detergent companies, for example, laundry mm -hmm. detergent. And it's actually cheaper for them to buy virgin material than it is for them to buy re material from recycled plastic to make their products. And until that price dif that shifts, we we need we need demand for those recycled plastic products and we don't have it in this country and on top of that we don't have a lot of places in the country that can actually recycle the plas plastic and turn it into usable materials and those are the types of conversations that chris and i would have uh at least on a weekly basis so he's yeah. a, another example of folks within the city that have the knowledge and know what needs to happen they they don't have a Department of Environment behind them as a collaborative, connective tissue to help th make change within the city. Okay, uh, I don't want to get bogged down on just this topic, but let me end it by asking each of you, if you were going to make a change in recycling tomorrow, just to start, just to get us on the right path, what would it be? I, I have two, so it's just not fair. You have two? Um, I have two. Go. That are Go for it. All right. okay. So remember the words reduce, reuse, recycle? Yeah. Reduce yep. is about not not um, not providing that waste in the first place. So there are a lot of cities that have um, ordinances now about not allowing packaging, not allowing you know certain things. People in some places take their products and they take off the wrapping at the store and then bring it home. They don't have that waste. And then it's up to the commercial enterprise to do something with that waste. Um, there, there, there's, there was a so large manufacturer. Right, right. So it, you push it to the manufacturer and you make them do it. Will it make the price go up? Probably a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at the price of waste and both environmentally and economically, it's worth it. Um, so that's one thing. It's just a whole zero waste aspect of this. And there's a great really well thought out program that had streets and sand and everybody involved that we were pushing towards and that died. The other thing is waste franchising. I can't say enough about that because that's where com competition really comes in and where efficiencies really come in. Indianapolis has what, it. Arlington what, has it. What is, excuse me, Suzanne, what is waste yeah. franchising? Waste franchising is, it, it is a competitive, um, privately run um, waste program um, and, and streets and sand could be part of it. You, there's ways to do it where instead of having companies bidding for that multi-unit and another company for that multi-unit, they get a zone. And that's kind of what's been going on with blue cart, um, et cetera, but it's for everything. It's for commercial, it's for industrial, residential, everything. And so what so happens the whole is, neighborhood or the whole ward. Exactly. I think our, I think our plan was like six to nine, area. So it was more than just a ward. And that company would do everything. They would pick up, again, multi-unit, single, commercial, industrial, everything. Um, and we were pushing for that and we got slaughtered by the waste companies. Um, yeah, I remember because, that. Right. I mean, it was, it was literally the mayor said to me, this is just too bloody. You just have to give up. Um, and what that does, think about it. You know, you have one truck going down our alleys, right? You have, and you have fair pricing 
across the area too. And right, that's- and what you're saying is right now you can have two two uh, large buildings next to each other, and one has one service and one has another service, mm-hmm. and there's and then the the one goes to this building, and then is going seven blocks over and you know sixteen blocks yep. th- that way yeah, too, and charging to get- a different rate. You know, Charging, and that's the key thing is talk about environmental justice. The research we did, low income communities were oftentimes paying three or four times the cost, three or four times the cost for their dumpsters to be picked up in businesses or whatever than they were in higher income communities. It just made my made me shiver because it's so disgusting. Um, so you so, would I mean, you, you would bring back fran- or attempt to bring franchising into the equation. Uh, absolutely. And uh, Sandra, what about you? Yeah, I think it's related to what Suzanne's saying. I would make it easier for people to recycle, period. Um, Because kind of education is really important and making it easy for folks to do that. Um, Have delivering bins on time, having, you know, neighborhood folks involved in the recycling process, making them a part of it when I feel like that's not necessarily true in every community. Well, and that, we really but do have to, to make them part of that. To be fair, there, there have been block captains and this was uh, an effort that, uh, that I don't know if it still continues, but it certainly was a big part of it back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't know if it's, I don't, I'm not sure yeah, that exists right now. Yeah, I get a few emails from recycling block cl- captains still. Okay. And you know, they were all, in, I hate that, I'm not going to use that word. Um, so they all had kind of an infrastructure in place so they could work a certain amount of blocks and let everybody know today's your day for recycling. We'd had signs that you could put up in your front yard, et cetera. But, but, but really to go, it's not even just that. It's like, why would people recycle, especially if they think it's getting dumped in the garbage? Well, well that's you know, the and, thing. And that's, yeah, it, yeah. You have to tell the story about why it's important and re-engage folks in just like those old commercials with, you know, give a Kermit. hoot, don't pollute. We have to yeah. reignite folks and help them get passionate about recycling and help them understand how it helps our life, improves our lives. We have to have that conversation. And I don't think we're having that on a on a block by block neighborhood level and we need to if we're going to make it and i honestly i think single sort when we when folks had to sort their own recycling i think that made a difference and when we started telling people that you could just throw it all in one bin and we'll re- we'll sort it for you at the plant that i think kind of dis disconnects people from the importance of recycling. You know, we had uh, Marta Keene from Will County on the show a few weeks ago, and I asked her, I said, do you think single stream recycling, that is, the, you know, where you throw the paper and the, and, the, and the metal and the glass all in one cart, I said, is that the best thing that ever happened to recycling or the worst thing that ever happened to recycling? And I think the jury's out. Nobody really knows because yeah. now, we're, now we're looking at glass as a contaminant, and it's one of the most eminently recyclable products out there. Um, right. And uh, well, have you guys ever gone to one of the MRFs, municipal recycling yeah, and yeah. bubble gum yeah. facility? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when Blue Cart first started, when Blue Bag, Blue Bag, don't even get me started, but Blue Cart. <laughs> I'm um, glad <laughs> you feel that yeah. way. Uh, um, it, it was incredible technology. I mean, and it was employing people in these centers and their magnets. And you could see how all the different types of materials went into separate areas and got organized, et cetera. And of course there was a market then. Um, but I, I agree with Sandra, it's, 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 it's education and engagement. Um, it's also the massive lack of trust in the government that they're gonna actually do something with it. There's so much cynicism, yeah. I have a hard time. I recycle every but, day. But, but I'm going to stop you there, Suzanne. I, I would argue that the city of Chicago engendered that cynicism by having Absolutely. by Blue Bag. Absolutely. Because people, oh, I, I really Blue Bag was a terrible failure. And what it taught the people of Chicago is that the system doesn't work and they still believe that. Right. But people who I are agree. engaged also know that the Blue Cart stuff, a lot of that was getting dumped. And so. You know, and, and I don't know the state now, but I do know when I put my stuff out in the blue card, I, I say to myself, there's a little part in my heart going, God, I hope it goes somewhere. Um, <laughs> yes. <you know? laughs> oh, 
Oh, that's I feel the same way. Oh, yeah, man. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. Um, well, and yeah. I, I'm going to agree with you, Sandra. Education, education, education. Mm -hmm. We have done so little in that regard. And now things have gotten uh, much more complicated. Yeah. We have so many different materials. People throw plastic toys in there. They throw CDs in. Yeah. They throw everything. You know, that, the, whole I, the whole idea of yeah. wish, wishful recycling, um, I, I don't. I don't like putting it on the backs of the consumer because I don't think the consumer has been given a chance to do it right. On the other yeah. hand, the consumer needs to be educated. Uh, and so yeah. how, how do we make and that not happen? just once. That's the thing, not just once. It's an it's ongoing a continuous process. process. All right, yes. and, and one more thing before we go. We got a message from Carter O'Brien, uh, who you Hi, know. Carter. Uh, from Hi, the, Carter. <laughs> from, from the Field Museum and Chicago Recycling Coalition. He says, it is completely illogical to have the Department of Streets and Sand in charge of inspecting buildings they do not service. In my opinion, the Department of Buildings should be charged with enforcing recycling in those five-plus unit buildings. Just make it one more box they check when they are already there for uh, safety-related inspection, like elevators, fire escapes, and so on. That makes Just like gas stations, just like restaurants, just like there is a completely bifurcated enforcement process that could be made a lot more efficient. Yeah, and, I, yeah. and I'm telling you, uh, I... I I know it's complex, and as we just discussed for 20 minutes, it is a very complex issue. I've always thought also that it, it, it boils down to political will and that the person at the top has to say, make this happen. Please, yeah. you know. And it's it's, it's, it's got to be easy for the actual person doing the recycling as well. Yeah, yeah uh, for sure. It does. And, and, and it may sound simplistic, but... You know, it's it's okay. It's it's, and we're going to be breaking here in just a second. But it's like that. I sent you an article the other day um, about the collisions, uh, bird collisions Birds. at McCormick Place. Okay, and the study comes out, and this is not a fly by night thing. No pun intended. Um, but, <laughs> wow, I can't believe I said that. Uh, and um, but these birds. As we're migrating to a new topic. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh -huh. All right. Um, but. We could reduce bird mortality by 60% just by turning off yeah. half, half the lights at McCormick Place. And this is a study uh, that uh, uh, Doug Stotts, who's been on our program, he's mm -hmm. from the Field Museum, was, was part of this. So these are, these, are, these are experts who are deciding this. So if I'm the mayor, I, I look at that and I say, make that happen tomorrow. Why does that not happen tomorrow? What is it about our system that it can't work? That way. This has been going on for 20 years. We started the Lights Out program, and I oh God, I don't even know when that was. A long time ago. And it, it mm -hmm. and you can even do it in a good faith effort with buildings. What we learned is Hancock, all these places, by turning off their ornamental lighting during these critical times, they save energy. They yeah, save energy. Since, 19, since 1999, actually. Yeah. So and and so it's sim it's the cleaning people. Um, that are working there at nights and the lights are on, put the blinds down. I mean, there's a lot of simple things that can be done, but there's no communication about it. Um, you know, and, and so well, those I, I'm looking from a policy standpoint here, you know, and right. a person like a CSO or a, a commissioner of the Department of the Environment, can't you grab the mayor and say, can you please make this happen? It will make a big difference. Well, the question is making what happen, right? So you have to Again, it's a bunch of pieces. So the Building Owners and Managers Association, who have all the big buildings downtown, they're a key partner. You have to have them involved. Um, it can be done, but it, it has to be regular communication and acknowledgement of people who are doing the work. And then they say, yeah, I want to I look for this. Yep. And yeah. you may have right. to incentivize them, too. Right? Yep. What was that, Sandra? Right. I said it's education, and you may have to incentivize the building owners through yeah. something like Retrofit Chicago or some other existing lever that could be a communication vehicle to get owners to turn their lights off. Uh, yeah, Maybe but but, but, the, but, but again, it's it's you, those wheels have to start rolling so that the, I mean, every day that you don't do this, it's it's yeah. hundreds or yeah. thousands of birds that die. All yeah. right. The study comes out. Yeah. It's it's in Block Club. It's in the Tribune. A bunch of people talk about it. How does it then get implemented? Where right? And and, and so who, 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 whose job is it to take that ball and run with it? Yeah, 
there's the carrot and stick, right? There's the incentive and then there's the stick. Chicago bird collision monitors, what if they were out and they charged a certain amount for every bird they found next to a building? You know what yeah. I mean? Like there's there's all kinds of ways this could be done, um, but it's, mm -hmm. it's not undoable. And one more thing before uh, we break here that I, I think is uh, pretty important uh, from Audrey Fisher, our friend, mm -hmm. uh, we know Audrey Fisher. Um, and she says, Suzanne and Sandra, please include the issue of light pollution in Chicago. This has to do with what we're talking about now. Absolutely. Uh, when talking about the state of the environment in Chicago, we had a phenomenal opportunity to dramatically reduce light pollution in Chicago. Yet instead, Chicago installed horrific blue, rich, bright white lights. And I see on my local um, uh, the the uh, online group for this part of the city, Logan Square, people are all always uh, writing, why is that light so bright? It's shining through my bedroom window. Um, yeah. uh, instead, mm -hmm. Chicago uh, installed those lights that are harmful to the environment, ecosystems, and humans. As one of the first graduates of the Chicago Conservation Corps, um, there we go, I would be more than happy and willing to teach C3 about light pollution and how to reverse it in Chicago and would greatly appreciate a chance to talk with the right people to get starlight back over Chicago. Um, Let's make it happen, girlfriend. Yeah. And she, there's this group called the Adler Planetarium. I don't know if you've heard of them, <laughs> but we've got like one of the most brilliant research groups there who know this stuff. Like collaborate <laughs> well and, you know? and, and and when we get back to bureaucracy here if you want to talk deep state deep state is you know uh, the right wing likes to talk about deep state mm -hmm. and just being nefarious and so forth i'll tell you what deep state is it's bureaucrats in a place like the city of chicago that yeah. don't change over time um yeah. I, I, a couple of years ago i went out with alderman or, yeah what was that three years ago we were out uh, two, I thought it was two years ago, but uh, Scott Wag is back. Uh, we yep. went out there with Audrey and some other folks, and we tested the lights mm -hmm. that they new lights they had put in. They Humboldt were, Park. Mm -hmm. They were. Uh, this was in Humboldt Park. The and they, LED lights. Uh, yeah, the new yeah. ones, and they were way up on the blue spectrum, which is too yeah. blue. They're at three thousand K, and we had uh, a guy from Canada, a company who had a twenty two hundred K light warm full nice, spectrum light beautiful glow amazing. we could not get the city the scott could not get the city's attention uh at all so what's they, the question? What, sorry go ahead i'm sorry well i'm just going to say they they basically they were saying that i think the purchase is done we're, we're installing these yeah. uh contracts in whether they're the right temperature or not you know they went not. off the old study but that was right. and it's also i mean as sandra knows as an engineer right? Which I didn't know you were. That's super cool. Um, you know, there are a lot of engineers who, who, who are most concerned about redundancy. Is it going to do the same amount of work as the other one? And the question is violence. I mean, really, it's about safety, period. And so are you sure it's going to cover the same amount of area? If it's not as bright, Will it be not as good? There's a lot of education and but the science. But the stuff, yeah, there is, and part of the studies show that if you have a softer glow, it's easier for people to adapt, you know, to to the light. So you actually see better with a lower yeah. Uh, Kelvin. Yeah, color was a huge thing in the lower Kelvin. Nasty. You could yes. see more. So anyway, yeah, and the other right. piece to kind of the one for one thing is what I'm observing is they're putting the LED lights in the existing fixtures, and I'm wondering if anybody ever had the discussion do we need fewer fixtures with better more effective lighting well i don't yeah. think that's happening which is chicago's overlit period there's right. too many lighting yep. fixtures on the street well, anyway and now they're just putting in brighter light in the same number of fixtures it doesn't really make sense because we're and terrified cities like la and others they they yes. did the research about if you put in an infrastructure that looks like xyz abc you're gonna city of city save a ton of money by like year six you'll have paid it all back right in energy costs right. alone so again there's an economics to this that if it's thought through and again then there's the political will because oftentimes there's a cost up front that it, it just makes sense environmentally and economically it's, okay it's right. uh, and if you fly over la or dc you'll see that there's a huge reduction in light in the the light pollution but the mm -hmm. streets are lit 
they feel the same as they did before they did the retrofit. And we did not learn that lesson in Chicago. All right, we need to take this uh, break. When we come back, uh, we're going to talk environmental justice and trees. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki, Suzanne Malik McKenna, Sandra Henry are with us, and we hope you stick around for yet one more half hour of discussion. The best thing about my job is the excitement of uh, waking up every morning just wondering what the challenges are going to be that day. So how do you like my office? We lead with safety. It's the first thing that I think about when I wake up. It's the last thing I think about when I go to bed. We've got a number of employees in the office, myself included, who've been, been around for 10, 15 plus years. So people enjoy working for the company. And staff retention's a thing that we're very, very keen on. It's no secret that the world of arboriculture is a male-dominated industry, but there is a fearless group of women out there that are determined to change that, and I'm really proud to be one of those women. At my office, I feel like you could take just about anyone put a crew together and send them out to a job and have it be successful. And that has to do with trusting the people you work with, feeling safe around them, and knowing their strengths and weaknesses. One of the proudest moments working uh, with Barlet for me was being the first to do training in a Spanish class. Barlet is all about promoting from within. We really want to focus on our people and make sure that they're trained, make sure that they understand their role and you slowly grow through your experience and then you improve and, and move on to different roles within the company. There's always new positions, even at a base level, myself included. I started off as a climber and I've worked my way through to being local manager in the office. Bartlett has been really great about recognizing any kind of roadblocks for different genders, different races, people of different nationalities, and just kind of taking a bulldozer to all of those roadblocks. Every tree needs a champion. 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 Welcome to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio with just a sip on of humor. Or is that a dash? Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Here they are again, Peggy Malecki and Mike Novak. All I need is good food to eat and make me healthy, wealthy, wide awake. Lettuce, tomatoes, root, and bacon. What about those sweet potatoes? All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good tools to make me music porches. Okay, welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. You got everything uh, taken care of there, Suzanne? I was looking for my favorite tree book. Oh, which is your, what is your favorite tree book? It's, it's the book that turned me on to all of this, which is, I mean, it's not very exciting, but it's Michael Durr's. Um, ah. um, the, you know, the manual of Woody and ornamental yep. plants, yep. right? I, and it was my first class in horticulture that just turned me on to trees. I, I have a beat up copy of that book around here someplace. Yeah, copy, uh, yeah. In the other it's room. The well, the you know, I was going to go with the other one, but let's start there since, you know, we're talking every tree needs a champion and the trees in Chicago. Good uh, segue. You got some, yeah. <laughs> yeah and why not? The Scott tree Jameson. Yeah. Scott Jameson with Bartlett. Talk about champion. Uh, Eric Rosenickel, Bartlett. Woohoo! I know. You I know, know Skeet's um, watching this morning. Yeah, I gotta Bartlett. tell you. I mean, thank you to them for sponsoring this show. Um, I've worked with them forever. Scott Jameson, along with Larry Hall, years ago, helped start Tree Keepers in 1991. Thirty years this year. I, went, um, we I almost, remember we going to the, younger, of course, I remember um, going, so going to the, the yeah, they are, um, only the trees have aged. Yeah. I was, I was, I was going to say I was at the 25th anniversary, uh, of, uh, of a uh, tree. And now we're at 31. Yikes. Okay. No, we're at 30. We're at 30. 30 this year. Oh, this is okay. 30. This year at 30. Oh. And, and, uh, and I know you're, you're what tree, are you tree keeper? Number one. I am. I started it in 19. Yeah. 91. 91. Yeah. I am a tree keeper wow. number 417. So 
Um, and there are uh, thousands now. So there are thousands, yeah. Which is so great. such a cool thing. And this week, uh, you know, let's look at something positive that happened uh, in the environment in the city of Chicago this week, which is uh, the uh, the finance committee created a 13 member urban forestry advisory board. Uh, yeah. Now it doesn't. It's only an advisory board, so it doesn't have a lot of power. Uh, but it's it's still very, very important. Why would you say that is, Suzanne? Well, it's, I mean, again, it's everything we've just been talking about, education and engagement, right? If you have aldermen and city commissioners uh, working together with experts in the field, um, you know, we've got open lands in the Morton Arboretum right here, right? Botanic Garden. Arboretum, mm -hmm. you know, just did their 2020 census. We've got so much data about trees, about what they do for our environment and our mental health and violence. There's so much yeah. research now. And yeah. um, we need people having that conversation regularly. And if you have it with aldermen and city council, hopefully they'll, the, the more they learn, the more they'll advocate for the right practices for trees. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. I agree with that. Oh, I was just going to say, part of the problem uh, that we've had in the past is that uh, there hasn't been this understanding of how important trees are. And with alders, um, their responsibility, are part of it has been what trees get cut down. And right. it, it's not been so much about uh, about putting new trees in, planting new trees, but the power to remove trees. Yeah. And we've had some egregious or, examples. Or trim them very strangely. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, yeah. One of the things that the uh, they do is they limb them up like crazy, in which is not great for a tree. But it, I understand why they do. They always say it's a secure, a safety thing, uh, security. They're called broccoli or they, spears. Yeah. Or Rock they cut down the tree because they think it's the residents think it's going to break their plumbing. That's right. another myth. Oh yeah, that's right. We talked about that uh, the other day, Sandra. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that whole idea the roots go for water. So your pipes are already broken people. Um, but I, I think it's just important but, to understand 30 years ago when we started tree keepers, we still had the same problem, right? People don't understand that trees are part of our urban infrastructure there. Are they as important as a fire hydrant? Maybe not uh, a street light. Maybe not, but do they make quality of life? In our I, I, I'm, I'm going to disagree Definitely. with you totally, Suzanne. Sorry. Uh, they are at least as important as those things. I mean that, and that's the problem. I'm, I'm saying, and they're living things; they're yeah, alive. Right. Yeah, but uh, you know, and, and until we recognize that and understand their in, in, in infrastructure, okay, it's like trying to get re Republicans to understand that infra infrastructure is more than just roads. Trees are infrastructure in a right. city. So before yeah. you guys keep slamming me over that comment, which I can hear Scott Jamison and everybody going, "What are you saying?" <laughs> I'm saying in this in the public's perspective, you know, they're not going to say tree versus light or tree versus water or something like that. So it's it's incumbent upon all of us to demonstrate how important that is in the infrastructure. And if you look at emerald ash borer and, and communities that have lost everything, you know, yes. from their energy costs to their quality of life. I mean, it's just it's significant. Yeah. And that's a great point, Suzanne. Trees shade homes reduces the need to run their air conditioning but we don't we don't make those connections with folks right that's yeah. really important to talk yeah. about that there is an energy benefit and in addition i hope we're going to talk about the decarbonization of buildings later on oh yeah but in, in the scheme of things like the big picture we have to if we're going to be successful or at adapting to climate change and potentially mitigating it we have to decarbonize decarbonizer buildings and we also have to plant lots of green stuff including trees if we're going to really and it, be successful at yeah. this and it's going to take it all ties, of those pieces yeah go ahead well Sorry, excuse me i was going to say and that ties into the other thing we were talking in this half hour the social justice and equity issues but you know where are I, those trees yes, planted? i think yeah exactly right. where those trees but so while we you've mentioned the uh the decarbonization working group the Building Decarbonization Working Group. Tell us a little bit about that, Sandra. How did that come about? And you're you're part of that uh, that group. I am. It's oh, pretty exciting, right? I'm facilitating the new construction subgroup of the working group. Um, but you know, we've got this ordinance in place to become 100% renewable energy by 2035. Well, how do we do that? First of all, we have to 
decarbonize our buildings. And that means we need to not use carbon producing fuels inside our homes and our multifamily buildings. So we're, there's a number of levers we have to press to get to that. One of them is to work with the city to figure out what that strategy looks like. Um, are, is it an ordinance? Is it a code change? We could do a zero code there. And so we've convened a group of folks um, architects, engineers, community members, community organizations to have that discussion. And there's three groups. One is looking at new construction, one is looking at existing construction, and the other is looking at training and financing options. There's three subgroups in there. And I'm running the new construction group, or facilitating it, rather. So the, the outcome would be, um, at the end of this working group, process is we present a list of recommendations to the city for how we can implement a decarbonization strategy that will get us to 100% clean energy by 2035. That's the outcome. And the success um, so of that outcome will be if the city listens and yes. internalizes it and implements it and institutionalizes it. Yes. Because you're going to come up with amazing recommendations and then the cojones will have to come out um, <laughs> yes. and, um, not the rabbits and, um, <laughs> and 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 then it's how do you implement it because it can yes. be done um, and it create jobs and improve quality. and create jobs you know I mean as we know there's there's major um, you when you look at the energy maps that CNT and I think then elevate did for years you can look at where the worst energy waste is happening South and west sides where homes haven't been rehabbed, where they haven't yes. been made more energy efficient. And that is where communities are paying a much larger proportion of their monthly budget on energy. It's, it is yes. criminal. Yeah. And, and so things like, things like this decarbonization um, program, anything we can do to make our buildings more energy and then how we produce the energy and then how we reduce the need for energy, AKA trees, as an example. Yeah. All those things coming together, you all of a sudden have solutions. Go figure. Yes. You know, it can it's be amazing. Done. But, but it can be done. <laughs> but as Suzanne points out, you, you can have this uh, committee uh, decarbonization, and you still need uh, the alder people and uh, the mayor political backing yeah you've got to have that I mean it's it's one thing to, to sit